chatting to industry experts that really get to answer this as well as explore what the future of these applications could be. And those in the audience, please, can you just drop your full name, your designation, um, and the role, you know, the role in your organization. If you've got a LinkedIn profile or anything like that, please feel free to pop it in the chat. Because aside from sharing information and sharing ideas, we are really looking to build the network around innovation. Um, I haven't introduced myself yet. I'm Lisa Parks, uh, soon to be Lang, although I am married already, but I haven't changed my name yet. Um, and I work for the Department of Economic Development and Tourism uh, in the Cape Catalyst Unit. And my role really is to look at fostering innovation in the public and private sector, but also looking at how we can integrate across directorates. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Kashifa Birkis. She's the CEO of the Saldana Bay Industrial Development Zone. Over to you, Kashifa. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to our first drone technology webinar, uh, a look at how drone technology is currently being used both locally and globally to advance the marine and energy uh, sector amongst others. And um, my opening words are innovation brings with it new ways of doing things. Um, and this includes how business is done, forming partnerships, maintaining relationships and driving hopefully positive change in society. Our ability to apply fourth industrial revolution technolo technologies for IR to our business operations will influence our relevance in the world of tomorrow. And I speak obviously not just of the IDZ, but of all enterprise in the world. Positioned between the headlining four IR trends of robotics and automation is drone technology where drone tech applications in the global energy and maritime sectors are on the rise. Technology advisory firms have estimated that by 2030, the entire unmanned aerial vehicle market is set to be worth $92 billion US. Compared to the 2020 value of $9.5 billion US, you get an impressive compound annual growth rate of approximately 25%. And I think the pandemic has been a real driver for, uh, for that growth, will be, and the consequences of needing to be remote um, and institute social distancing um, and, and strict health and safety protocols is being driven by the pandemic. So drones have demonstrated significant cost savings and reduction of safety risks for numerous industry players. And I think this is, in my experience, where drone technology is probably the most mature in the aspect of safety. Um, so the African opportunity for drone use is still underexploited though, representing a massive opportunity for investment to adequately capacitate the local industry for a more resilient and innovative future state and where the world is going. So if Africa wants to participate and it must participate in that future, then it needs to explore fully what drone technology uh, um, can and, and its potential. There is growing interest in the applications of drone technology and the opportunities for drone industry cross-pollination and spin-offs. This uh, webinar and the upcoming drone-centered events, particularly the Drone Technology Showcase and Challenge, is a mechanism that we hope will through which novel and relevant drone technology applications can be identified and developed to advance the industry. So with us today, we have experts and practitioners from other sectors of the, uh, of the economy. And I think this is, this is exactly what the Innovation Campus and the IDZ wants to do, is the cross-pollination of experience so that you know, we learn from others. We stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, as the IDZ, we look forward to be a part of this development journey and we value your feedback as always and hope and how to improve our offering and the positioning and the content of the Innovation Campus work. So thank you. 
Thank you so much, uh, Kashifa. So I just want to remind um, our participants that there are a couple of kind of webinar etiquette housekeeping rules that we'd appreciate if you can just abide by them. Um, obviously your mics are all off, so we hopefully won't hear anything going on in the background, like children being served lunch and dogs misbehaving. Um, we will endeavor to, to manage our own mics. Um, Please make use of the chat feature to contribute to the discussion. Um, also, you can add any direct questions in there. If you actually want to address it to a specific mm -hmm. panelist, please highlight that to us. Um, the, we'll, if we don't address the question during the discussion, we'll actually follow up per email um, so to ensure that everybody's voices are heard and you do get feedback. We are running a poll at some point and uh, making use of Mentimeter. So I hope you've you've navigated that before. It's pretty easy to use, pretty cool. And then we are recording the panel discussion. Um, and this can be shared with you later. And we do encourage you to share that with your colleagues and your stakeholders um, and people you work with in order to kind of spread the news and keep the network buzzing. I'm now going to switch over to a, uh, our keynote speaker, um, who's Professor Russell Phillips from the Nelson Mandela University, my alma mater. And there are a lot of us um, in the chat today that are actually hailing from um, Mandela, Mandela Metro. I was going to say Port Elizabeth, but I'm not allowed to. So over to you, uh, Prof Phillips. Thank you very much, Lisa. Thanks for the opportunity. Very warm welcome to everybody in attendance. My name is Russell Phillips. I'm from the Nelson Mandela University and I head up a group called the Mandela Autonomous Operations Group, which has a lot of synergy with what we're talking about today. In other words, innovation in the Saldana Bay context. Our research group at the university focuses on innovation of a variety of different devices from autonomous vehicles to renewable energy devices, etc. Of particular interest today are the autonomous vehicles, and I'm going to be sharing with you in the next 20 minutes some of our exploits, some of our adventures in this field of innovation. Our group was formed four years ago when we identified a need for innovation in the space of drones and various aerial devices out there. And we set out to set up some expertise regarding aeronautical design, both in-house and consultants that we have access to. And then we set up rapid prototyping from very small to large 3D printing we have available in-house, mostly through devices that we've developed ourselves. And then we've set up quite an extensive composites laboratory where we can do composite fabrication up to quite a large size and then we also have expertise in setting up flight test programs and executing these with in-house expertise and again with hired consultants that we have access to. Our group fills three basic roles within the university environment. The first being the formal tuition role where we supervise postgraduate students and undergraduate students busy with projects that relate to the space of autonomous vehicles and things that fly. And then we, we have an obligation to develop certain airborne test platforms based on funders who we have deliverables to execute for. And then finally, we are also a central hub to manage legally manage all the airborne operations of drones that are likely to be used at the university. So we are in the final stages of obtaining a, an ROC for the university, which will be operated under the control of our group. Next, I'll take you through some of the projects that we have already commenced on and some that we've completed, just to give you an idea of what it is we get up to. Here on the screen now is one of our early projects, this was James Sewell's master's project, so a formal project, uh, research project within the university. And this involved artificial intelligence applied to a, an autonomous fixed wing drone. And basically what the machine had to do was, was to fly a mission to a pre-assigned point, GPS point, 
and then identify and look for a particular target using image recognition. And once it found that target, to then execute a couple of runs over the target to ascertain wind direction, etc. And the target itself could also be moving to take that into account. For example, it could be a ship. And then work out the trajectory of the actual drop and then come in for a drop and drop a parcel, a small package, which was released automatically under the, the vehicle to land on a uh, predetermined spot within a certain level of accuracy. And that project worked well and James did get his masters and we met all deliverables on that one. This project probably has relevance to today's discussion which involves the maritime sector. Essentially this vehicle can actually take a parcel out to a ship which is in an approximate known position, identify the ship based on a QR code or some other marker on the ship's deck, make the runs and then drop a parcel on the ship's deck. This could be for reasons of economy where the ship would be too expensive to bring into port to fetch a small part, for example, or perhaps even to take medical supplies out to the ship. This rather strange looking fixed wing airplane has been dubbed Franken drone, apparently because it's not very pretty. Anyway, its purpose is to service the needs of a number of our scientists at the university who need to carry science payloads to various points at various altitudes. And the idea is that we have a highly reliable fixed wing aircraft, which is basically two fuselages flying next to each other with all systems duplicated and that is control systems, power systems, etc. And the idea being that if it, there's a failure of any one side, the aircraft can return using just the other, the other fuselage and make it back to base. It also has an extremely long endurance. It is all electric, this one. Uh, and then it also has a reasonable payload, which would be that center pod where the scientist would then place his various probes, etc., that he needs to acquire his data. And we then supply the lifting device by a Franken drone to go and execute this, this mission. In the maritime context, Franken drone has numerous applications that we can think of, particularly in the field of ship survey and possibly even anti-poaching operations offshore, etc. So a number of maritime possibilities exist for this type of machine. Electric powered drones, whether fixed wing or rotary wing, are plagued with short endurance normally. So how about adding solar power to these devices? Now this may seem crazy because solar power can only produce 140 watts per square meter approximately. So clearly there's not enough surface area on the wing of a fixed wing drone such as this one to keep it aloft. However, what we came up with was a plan to extend the endurance. In other words, extend the endurance that you would have had with normal batteries and extend the flying day with the use of solar cells on the wings, as you see here. And we weren't able to fly this machine for regulatory reasons at the time, but we did simulate it by running it on the ground at the power setting that it would require to, to remain airborne. And we worked out a seven and a quarter hour endurance. And that was assisted partially by the high aspect ratio glider type wing, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more later on when we talk of another development in progress. This next project looks at security drones. Now security or drones are already used in the security business, typically manually flown. What we came up with this master's project was to use artificial intelligence to send the drone to a predetermined point, which is automatically triggered via the security company or some operator. And then when the drone gets to the site, it looks for a certain target could be a human and then it follows that target and sends back a real-time display to the control room and uh, that project has worked out very well and shows great promise for the future and we're busy taking it further to try and get it to a commercial outcome. Now ocean science drones in the form of mini subs 
and uh, ocean gliders are well known and they're in use all around the world. And in fact, uh, there's one under development by ENSA, our technology station at the university. But anyway, our involvement from the flying side is to propose that we actually position these devices out to sea by means of a hybrid drone. So in other words, lift up these devices and place them in the water at a designated point without having to take an, an expensive or use an expensive vessel to take the drones out to sea. So that's another project we're looking at and we're going to use, we plan to use one of the drones which you're going to see later on that's under development. Now around 2019 we realized that the missing link in this drone business, this autonomous aerial vehicle business, was a machine that could take off vertically, land vertically, have a very long endurance and cover a lot of ground on its mission. And the only way to do that is with a so-called VTOL, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, of which there are a few out there. But now further we realize that to leverage the advantages of the various power plants, we needed to have a hybrid mix of internal combustion engine and electric motor. And the work started with looking at different concepts, seeing what's out there and seeing how we can improve on the idea. What we came up with was a unique layout where we have two large internal combustion engines on the fuselage that tilt and they provide the bulk of the thrust for hover. Now this concept is patented, that's why I can share it with you. And uh, during the hover phase, we use the small electric motors with relatively small battery packs with an endurance of just a couple of minutes to stabilize the machine during hover. That way we can leverage the advantages of both types of motor. And the development of the machine has gone through various stages with a very small model that you see flying in the videos and up to a 75% scale machine, which so far we've only been permitted to hover indoor, indoors tethered but soon once we have the, the approvals we're going to be flying that machine and then we are busy with the 100% scale machine there's some images there of the commencement of the plug manufacture the control system that we've used so far in the scaled models are identical to what's going to be used in the 100% scale machine and so far we've demonstrated fully autonomous flight and another interesting feature is the ability to do partial vertical takeoff takeoffs so in other words very short takeoffs and landings below normal stall speed and those would be used if it wasn't an absolute necessity to take off vertically if you had some sort of runway available to you the first goal we've set for ourselves is to fly the 75% machine to a position 50 kilometers offshore, hover over a spot on the ocean, and then lower a sensor into the water whilst hovering, take some ocean samples, retrieve the cord that holds the sensors, and then transition back into horizontal flight, fly the 50 kilometers back to the shore, and finish off with a vertical landing. In this <clears throat> VTOL journey so far, our team has had to deal with some power plants of very different sizes from quite small electric motors right up to 10 kilowatt electric motors. And what we learned along the way was that when these electric motors get to that sort of size, they carry quite a hefty price tag. And that made us develop a 20 kilowatt electric motor based on four much smaller hobby size motors which were ganged together to f to make one control unit or one power unit rather and that's proved quite successful that you see it on the screen now and uh, has proved to be a cost effective way of getting 20 plus kilowatts of power into these aircraft we've also dabbled with the hybrid side of things where we use an internal combustion engine to power a generator to provide onboard power for the drone, be it a normal uh, multi-rotor like you see there, or for use in the actual VTOL machine, which is the plan ultimately. In the process of testing this 
hybrid solution we came up with the machine there that we call Big Red which is basically a big quadcopter which we managed to lift 60 kilograms with and the machine has an all-up weight of 85 kilograms and with that rather crude petrol engine driving a generator that you see there we can get an endurance of up to two and a quarter hours for this quadcopter. In this image you see the battery pack that's used in the 75% size aircraft. Quite a large lithium polymer battery pack that was built in-house by the team. On a slightly larger and more ambitious scale, we've recently identified that a need exists for an aircraft that can patrol the coastline of South Africa. This aircraft could potentially be unmanned, ultimately, provided that regulatory challenges can be met. In the interim, the plan is to demonstrate ultra-long-range autonomous patrol capability using a suitable aircraft with a monitoring pilot on board. The efficiency of the high aspect ratio motor glider configuration will allow for a patrol range of more than 1600 kilometers when ultimately unmanned, thanks to the increased payload possible without the mass of the pilot on board. I've touched on just some of the projects underway within our research group. I purposely chose those with a maritime connection to best fit in with today's theme. None of these projects would be possible without the commitment and enthusiasm of our dedicated and very enthusiastic team. To name just a few, we have Carl Dupria on the far left who manages the Advanced Mechatronic Technology Center under which our group operates. Carl is instrumental in obtaining funds for all of these projects. Next to him is Sordica who looks after procurement and admin. Damien in the black jacket is our full-time drone consultant whose many years of experience in the drone field fast tracks our progress dramatically. The rest of the team consists of engineering students at all levels from undergrad to PhD. Their young smart minds are the fuel powering the innovations that come out of our lab. I'll leave you with a two minute clip showing what we get up to and how we make innovation fun. Thank you.
that was super interesting um, and happy to see that the fields at uh, the varsity are not only being used by Archie students to build anything that floats, that they're actually flying things as well. I think of interest to me there as well is the artificial intelligence, the, the hybrid component, the solar PV. So, you know, it's not the drone itself, it's, it's things that enable them to become more efficient, um, to extend the reach of application and things like that. I do have a question about tech transfer and uptake and commercialization, but um, if we don't have questions for the, from the participants around that later on, I'll see, see that question myself. I do see we've also got a question about payload. Um, we're not going to address them right now, we'll do it in the, the Q&A section, um, but perhaps if you could just look at what is the pay, a payload, the concept of the payload, and then having a look at, you know, if you can advise on the actual payloads on, um, on some, of, some of the drones that have been developed. I think that's particularly what the question that came from uh, Mr. Smith Godfrey. Um, at this point, we're just going to introduce our panelists. So thank you very much, Prof. Um, as I introduce the panelists, I'd like for you each to just switch on your camera and wave so we can um, associate a face with a name, um, and then we'll get into the actual uh, panel discussion session. So first up, we have Zane Cleofas from Marita Holdings. Zane, switch on, please. Okay, there could be a bit of a delay there. Um, next up, Lesicha Magoba from the Drone Council of South Africa and the DTRC. Okay, I'm not seeing the teacher, but I'm hoping you do. There we go. Cool. Zane, do you want to switch on your camera for us quickly? There we go, everybody. That's Zane. Zane, you want to say hi? Hi there. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let's teach him a go over. If you wouldn't mind just quickly switching on so we can say how's it. Hello. Super there. We see you. Um, Charles Elenfeld from Drone Ops, also involved in the Yes for Youth program. As you say, good morning, as you say. Good morning. There we go. And then Gary from Mark from Air Taxi now and Drones for Good. And Gary, the challenge to use to say how's it in another language. Good morning. There we go. Well done. <laughs> So um, thanks everybody for joining us today. And we really do look forward to the insights that you'll be sharing with us. For the audience, um, we're actually gonna put up a poll for participation now quickly, saying um, just to get a sense of your use of drones. Does your organization use drones at all? Um, you'll see now that it'll pop up on screen, it says drone usage on the top, and you've got the option to go yes, no, no, but we're interested, not sure. So I'll give you a minute or a second or two to click on your option. Um, and while you're doing that, I'll actually kick off with an opening question to our panelists. If you were to explain what a drone is to somebody that has never heard about drones, how would you explain it? What would you say? So I'm going to ask Zane first, um, and then maybe the others, you can just build on that idea. Zane? I think the easiest way to explain morning, everybody. Um, I posted the link there of uh, our company. Although it says Centurion, we're also in Cape Town. And I happen to be in the lovely West Coast, Langaban. So uh, I think the uh, simple explanation, I think Prof. Russell uh, said a lot about it as well. But for a person that's never been exposed to it, ever heard the word, I think the word drone is a bit uh, commonly used, but the, the it, it stems from essentially being an unmanned vehicle. Why I stop with a with vehicle is because it 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 is gone from an unmanned aerial vehicle to unmanned surface vehicle to unmanned subsurface vehicles, which we're going to speak about later on. But essentially, it's this item, whether it is propelled by um, a combustion engine whether it is uh, compel, you know, uh, with the battery powered or whatever the case may be, essentially without a human being being physically present in that specific vehicle, 
and it has the ability to either go subsurface, surface, or aerial. For various applications, of course. Zane, thanks so much for that. I'm actually wondering, I was going to give you all a chance, but I think you've probably nailed it. So it's a thing that can fly, swim, walk, um, take shots, can be under the water, can be in the air, can be on the moon. Um, that's a drone. Interestingly enough, coming into the convo, I was thinking drones, but um, <laughs> it's actually blown it wide open for me. Um, next, I'm actually going to, I was going to ask all of you, but I think that was super. I'm going to kick off with a question to Gary, actually. So thanks, if you wouldn't, Zane, if you might, wouldn't mind switching off your camera. Gary, drone technology applications in the maritime industry. So we're going to zoom in a bit, zoom being the operative word. From your experience, how is drone technology currently being applied internationally? Um, and how has this evolved over time? You know, I've, I've heard of it being used in oceanography and kind of aerial monitoring, ship survey, looking at weather, you know, and currents and things like that. Um, but it'd be interesting if you could just elaborate on your experience and insight in this regard. Okay, from our perspective, we've been taking quite a strong look at what's happening in Singapore with the maritime drone estate that they've established there. Um, as you're probably all aware, Singapore and Straits of Malacca are probably one of the busiest sea routes in the world. Um, you know, just as an indication, there are on a daily basis approximately a thousand ships anchored off its coast, um, and more than 130,000 ships call at Singapore every year. So that's a significant amount of ships. Um, a lot of them, uh, you know, just pass by, but there is an incredible opportunity at the moment that they are exploring companies like F Drone to actually supply those ships um, with anything from sport of parts, um, foodstuffs, uh, and you know even other urgent packages. Uh, you know, some quite often happens. Uh, some of the crew need passports, um, so you know those have got to be shipped out to the ship. It's not really worth sending out a boat. Um, uh, so th you know that is become quite a big thing. And if you look at, you know, South Africa, um, yeah, we don't have that many ships coming around. A lot of them are the sort of big oil tankers that never call it our ports. Our ports couldn't handle them anyway. Um, but, you know, there's over 9,000 ships that visit our ports annually. Um, and then in terms of tankers, about 7,000 vehicles, uh, you know, vessels uh, transporting about 30 million tons of crude oil, um, especially coming around the Cape. Now, when the Evergreen were blocked the Suez Canal, a lot more ships came around, especially container ships that usually take the shortcut through to Europe from uh, Asia. Uh, they were forced around the Cape. Um, and, you know, the opportunities are immense, especially with these oil tankers, in terms of just supplying them while they're coming around the Cape, you know, providing them with spare parts and all of that, as the professor mentioned earlier. Um, and then, you know, we've identified a number of other use cases, uh, specifically for South Africa and some of them were touched on by the professor, like protecting our fishing resources from exporta foreign exploitation. I think we're all aware that there's a lot of trawlers that come into our sh um, waters and fish illegally. Um, and quite often, you know, because of the high cost, uh, you know, and the small number of ships, our Coast Guard sort of operations actually have, uh, fishery department of fisheries have, a lot of them get away with that. And, uh, you know, with having these um, drones to assist, would help us to utilize those resources a lot better. Um, then there's also the, uh, you know, inspection of ships sailing around the coast, you know, looking for uh, ships illegally, um, le you know, dumping oil and other garbage into, our, into the waters. Um, that can be done from the sea. Also seaworthy inspections to make sure that those ships coming around our coast are actually seaworthy. Um, things like uh, search and rescue, you know, the ability the, the beauty of a drone is that quite often a lot of these drones can actually fly when man planes can't actually fly for, you know, in bad weather and things like that uh, at night. Um, so that also arranges. Coast Guard patrols also a big one. I think we're all aware of the um, struggles the Air Force are having keeping their, uh, you know, Dakota patrol um, aircraft in the air. Uh, this could supplement it quite a lot, especially long range drones. Um, such as those uh, 
you know, being used by both the Chinese and the US military and other militaries um, for those patrols. And then also environmental monitoring of our uh, estuaries and bays, uh, you know, everything from, you know, what, uh, um, you know, fish, uh, you know, whales are visiting at what time, keeping an eye on that, making sure tourists aren't bothering them, uh, making sure our estuaries stay clean, et cetera, you know, having that. And then also, you know, and, and then again, leading into that, you know, the whole monitoring of bird life, um, you know, so counting of penguins, um, all of that type of thing can be done much more efficiently by drones. Um, and then, you know, looking at this as well, you know, where you've got remote settlements, um, you know, up and down the coast, we can also, you know, be able to get in there quite quickly, um, support those people, you know, all of that. Also then, you know, if you look at what's happening around uh, our South Cape, South Cape coast, uh, the, all the developments going on in terms of developing gas fields and the search going on there, um, you know, or the oil and gas industry, uh, you know, if that does pan out and, uh, you know, those deposits turn out to be there, we're going to need ways and means of actually monitoring that and also being able to carry supplies to a lot of those rigs. Even with the exploration program, uh, you know, this cuts cost dramatically. Uh, the cost, you know, basic helicopter, you know, you're talking thousands of rand an hour. Uh, with a drone, you could do that a lot cheaper. Um, some of the drones we've been working with, we're working with an Australian company um, that has developed the technology now to do autonomous flights to ships. Uh, they use, they can actually land on those ships in all sorts of conditions. They're doing a lot of work with it, with the Navy there uh, in terms of that. So, you know, all of that technology is there. I think, you know, as the professor showed, we are quite far ahead of a lot of countries in what we're doing. So, you know, a lot of that can be done home, with homegrown systems, UA systems, and also aircraft. Um, other things I don't think people are doing. Yeah. Sarah, no, you've, got, you've, you've, you've mentioned a couple of real key benefits to use um, of drones, you know, from flying in bad conditions to the actual range, the fact that it, you know, it doesn't need to be manned and potential applications, obviously citing stuff that's been done internationally. I'm going to ask if the teacher could probably pick up where we leave off on this one to just cover, you know, examples of how drone technology is currently being used. So, you know, we know there's great potential, but what kind of uptake have we got at the moment on our shores within South Africa? So, Lisitia, if you wouldn't mind addressing that one for us. Thank you so much, Gary. Pleasure. Uh, certainly, Lisa. Um, very great contributions from uh, all the panelists thus far, so I'm really excited about this. I'd just like to shed light on a concept called um, intellectual property, dual usage. Um, so where we are concerned, a lot of the technology um, that is currently being used in drones is not necessarily new. And for the most part, a lot of this technology has been funded um, by uh, the government. So there is a body of knowledge that is readily available um, once the uh, acts are in place to actually be able to provide the know-how um, at a highly expert level to the general person, including SMMEs, to be able to leverage technology that was developed in the defense sector um, once it's de-armored into the civilian sector. And this is not necessarily limited only to um, aerospace, strictly speaking. As you allude in your question, the applications um, in the energy. So take, for example, if you look at um, uh, wind farms, drones have a particular interesting application over there because of the uh, aerodynamic requirements of the blades that are used over there, but also the materials technology. So if you look at um, natural fibers um, using the likes of, um, of flex, you can achieve a, a really interesting characteristic while also bolstering the, the agricultural sector 
for an application that will be used uh, to generate energy using wind farms. So one almost needs to have a, a multidisciplinary hat when you're approaching um, know-how in 4IR. And um, uh, drones are an interesting example of 4IR because if you think about it genuinely, the technologies that are applied in 4IR, such as in drones, are not necessarily new, but the way that they're being used and the way that they're being put together um, creates so much value that you, you have to almost create a new category for it. Um, I've noticed that within the university spaces as well, the, the, the notion of a multidisciplinary approach uh, to learning is also coming to the fore, um, but it's something that has been well embraced within the homeschooling environment for quite a while. Um, another application um, for, for drones um, within the energy fraternity uh, throughout the value chain could be, take for example, within uh, coal mining, if it's an open pit, um, you could also look at the, the monitoring of key infrastructure for uh, moving uh, fuel or, or oil. Um, so that list really kind of goes on and on and on. I think it is important though to, to recognize that um, South Africa has been at the forefront of driving that particular technology where um, um, the likes of ICAO um, have actually accepted that other countries would be able to duplicate some of our regulations, specifically on the African continent, uh, to be able to do what we do. Um, so the baseline that has been established in, in South Africa uh, is second to none. As a matter of fact, where innovation is concerned, uh, South Africa has one of the leading brains um, uh, that keep coming through and through across different industries. Um, the, the one particular area that I think will get more attention, uh, call it a prediction, um, um, if you will, is um, the utilization of drones for the establishment and maintenance of rocket launch capability um, in South Africa. Um, what you'll find is there will be an ongoing uh, demand for further rocket launch capability, specifically for Africa because of its um, uh, its natural uh, uh, um, favor in terms of uh, clear skies and uh, and access to a lot of the telemetry um, and drones for a uh, launch site that would be uh, on the ocean for our large coastlines uh, makes a lot of sense because you can carry these very large um, payloads um, uh, on structures to be able to do whatever repairs you require but also to be able to do clearance checks, you'll be able to use those drones without needing to have personnel um, go on ship all the way uh, to the launch site and then uh, on their way back. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now, but this is a lovely topic. <laughs> With so many cool ideas on, on applications and literally the sky's the limit. Um, but now thinking about the ocean, extent of the ocean and the maritime industry, I actually have a question for Zane. Um, with your knowledge of the industry in Saldana Bay in particular, how are drones being used in that region? And are there specific maritime operations that have not yet picked up on the application of drones that could actually benefit greatly? Um, I mean, we may even have representatives from those sectors or those manufacturers or you know, in, in the chat with us today. So I think if you could share a bit on your local insight there, this would be really valuable. Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, I think a lot has been said about drones uh, and the application of the unmanned, you know, in the unmanned uh, vehicle environment. Within the, within the uh, let's call it the Saldana Bay area, uh, let's call it the Saldana Bay municipal, municipal area, uh, which, which, which is a little larger than just Saldana Bay or the port area. I think I've got a, I've got a little bit more insight uh, because I used to be the head of border operations for South Africa, you know, for, for quite a bit. And I know drones has been, or the applications of the unmanned aerial vehicle environment was particularly of interest due to the fact that uh, I know the, there was an interest from the, from the that MCM environment, uh, the Marine Coastal Management environment with ourselves as the enforcement uh, agency to start dealing with uh, with uh, with innovative ways of 
of, uh, of uh, you know, um, the theft of marine resources, uh, contraband smuggling, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the experimental phases of drones is uh, it's much older than I think that we think within the West Coast environment. In recent years, I know there was the application was, uh, and I think Charles is on the chat as well. They've been involved with disaster management, but there's things like aerial surveys, uh, you know, um, uh, back in the day, I know the military also tried to use it uh, to look at, uh, uh, you know, from a hyd uh, hydrographic perspective. Um, security applications, I know for a fact, uh, that's been used extensively within, the, within this area. And then obviously with the film and media, I mean, a lot of people, uh, nowadays, I think during lockdown in particular, with the rise of Netflix, a large portion of South African movies shot along the, the, the Cape Town coastline. In particular, there's a few shots, a few impressive shots was done, I think, uh, in the Port Owen environment, in the Saldana Bay environment, Langabain environment, and so on. Um, the, so the media and film guys are actually the trendsetters when it comes to a lot of these things, although the tech uh, emanates from, you know, predominantly your, your gaming and your military environment. Uh, and then direct, uh, direct uh, agricultural use, uh, a few forward thinking farmers has been, has been looking at uh, the crop spraying environment for, uh, for unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, we've recently seen um, um, with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the loss of a lot of the forestry with the up north, uh, we started looking at direct seeding, for instance, and I think this could be an innovative way to start looking at, well, you know, with, with the Cape environment being plagued with a lot of um, child fires, which is very stock standard during certain times of the year, and, and how to quickly deal with not just the fire at that given point in time, but also things like seeding, etc. Um, there's obviously urban planning, spatial planning, it's been used for uh, looking at road mappings and so on. That's the things that I know of that's been happening within this environment. But I mean, to a very, very small extent, the, the, the unmanned, uh, you know, and, I, and I'm gonna stick to the word unmanned vehicle environment is not being fully exploited within this, in this region. And this brings me obviously to the next part of your question, you know, what can be, you know, or basically leverage or the maritime operations that has not picked up on, the, on this hype around drones. I think, for instance, uh, you know, uh, Gary spoke about the the, the huge cost that uh, involves um, helicopters, for instance, the use of helicopters for the transportation of um, and supply of larger items uh, to vessels, spare parts, uh, the ferrying of people offshore, etc. Whereas your drones has been evolving so quickly, um, you know, uh, you, uh, um, like Prof. Philip said earlier on as well. Um, yeah, you know, your dual engines, your vertical takeoff and landing with the fact that it takes larger payloads. It now takes humans. We've all seen the concept of Uber drones, for instance, or drones for, for the use of uh, it as a, as a, in, in the Uber environment. Uh, we've seen taxi drones. We've seen um, subsurface drones for the use of, uh, um, you know, um, hydrographic uh, mapping. Um, which is not used uh, extensively within uh, within the environment currently. There is the you know port security. You probably will not have to put a, a the lives of uh, South Africans or people in port in danger if there, for instance, is an outbreak on a vessel. Uh, it can be dealt with you know remotely. You can uh, ferry people. You can uh, use it in in uh, in uh, surveilling uh, suspicious activity. Um, you know, and, and, it, and, and the thing is with range and endurance um, that's now being, being, uh, being extended to, to very large distances. I mean, drones nowadays fly 150 kilometers to deliver, for instance, medical aid. Uh, we've recently encountered uh, something similar in India. Um, you know, there's environmental surveillance and that is not being optimally used uh, in the study of or marine studies for that matter. Search and rescue exercises. Um, um, and specifically along this coastal area, where it becomes extremely difficult to get uh, to get vessels out. Again, Gary referred to the fact of the aging uh, fleet of uh, of uh, the navy, the decks in the air force, and their inability to to actually patrol our uh, EEZ. Um, then you have also cargo ship inspections, crew clearances that can be done because you know facial recognition and biometrics is already 
as part of the census with our drones. Why not just use that to, to clear crews instead of them coming alongside an and a, and a immigration official boarding the vessel? Um, so you got this array of applications is not being exploited. Zen, I'm going to stop you there because it's very clear to me that the, uh, there is a plethora of opportunity when it, opportunities when it comes to application. Um, and something you mentioned earlier was the word seed and seeding. And um, I'm quite interested in this is going to segue us across into my question to Charles. So thank you very much, Zane, about how are you seeding uh, the potential of moving into kind of the 4RR space and the world of drones with the youth. Um, so Charles, you know, I know there's been some amazing work being done at the Drone Academy that perhaps our participants don't know about, which has been set up um, in, in Saldana Bay, and also in the work with the Yes for Youth program. So what, Ray, can you tell us a little bit more about it and what was the driver to actually start this academy? Right. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, yes, I'm talking to you from the Genesis app here in Fredenburg, uh, in Lobel. Um, the driver to start our drone academy here, I'd say center point of it all was youth development. Um, also that uh, I work for the company DroneOps and our training subsidiary company called Artpass Training Academy. They've ever had a history of training more than 700 drone pilots in the past. So uh, we're quite good at training the people. We understand the regulatory environment, um, but also with our service delivery subsidiary companies at Advanced Aerial, we have found that um, drone pilots, commercial drone pilots and pilot operators, this is a job um, that's very good for young people to do. A lot of the people in our companies are quite young um, and uh, we have had a lot of work in the past with Transnet, working together with Transnet, especially in the security industry, um, and work being performed by some of our younger uh, commercial drone pilots and pilot operators. So I think it was a natural progression for us to, you know, enter into talks with Transnet, um, the Yes for Youth organization, the Youth Employment Service. They were collaborating with us, with Transnet. And, uh, you know, I think it was a matter of joining the dots. Um, and, uh, you know, basically looking to the future, bringing the drone industry down to a rural area accessible to younger people, getting the youth early on into this. Um, we believe that, you know, let's shape the trees while they are young, let's grow them, let's equip them with appropriate skills for what we need them to do outside in the working world. So, uh, yeah, we're doing our best here. What was also a big part of the being the driver for the Drone Academy, I must acknowledge it, is our youth. I think as also a stakeholder in their own future, the eagerness, the willingness, the volunteer base in which they, uh, this current group signed up, the first 20 are well on their way to achieving their goalposts to entering this in industry. So I think it's a lot of people that came together. I don't want to acknowledge a particular driver, but at the center of this, it's all about youth development. It's about a springboard or a launching platform to get people into the commercial drone industry. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much for, for elaborating on that. And I do hope that you said shape the trees, not shape the cheese, but um, we'll hear about that later. Um, I was going to pose the question around some challenges um, to Gary, but we are running a little over time. So what I'm going to do is flip it on its head. And from our participants, if you wouldn't mind popping in the chat, one, some of the applications you know of where drone technology has been used, and maybe even the link or something like that. Um, and then secondly, some of the challenges you've experienced. Um, Charles, I was just wondering, as people are doing that, if you can many, mention some of the challenges regarding the adoption of drone tech, um, it'll maybe seed some of those ideas. And then after, after that, Charles, I'm gonna move back to Gary around adoption as well. Okay, 100%, thank you. Um, look, I'd say the drone, the commercial drone industry, the way we experience it. It's like any emerging and developing industries, there's a lot of challenges. There's a myriad of them. A few specifics that I think we can identify is number one, it's awareness. All of us, we see on the social media, on the news, 
every now and then we celebrate the first for drones, the first the rescue of people lost on a mountain performed by drones at the Cape Town EMS service. Um, a lot of firsts are happening. So in a way, I think drones are not as prolific as we want them to be. They are not so accessible as we want them to be. We have wonderful things in the labs. And I think people like uh, Professor Phillips and uh, Gary from Mark, and I think a lot of us that, you know, we, we drank the drone Kool-Aid. I mean, my company, sometimes we drink our own Kool-Aid, but there's a big gap between the wonderful technology we have in the laboratories to what we have in the street. In the commercial drone industry outside, most of the flights are performed by drones with about a 30 minute plus or give or take flight time and a, a range of about 10 kilometers. So it is still a very limiting area. But the main concern regarding the awareness, I'd say, is the public, um, the access to this technology. Um, drones, you know, public, they fear something that is new, something they don't understand. Privacy laws, that is an issue that needs to concern. So I think we have to do a lot about awareness, maybe start at the schools, maybe we should boost the STEM subjects, boost uh, aviation training or anything to do with this to put people in a better mind space to be able to accept this new technology and to work with us. Everybody is a stakeholder in this. Um, I mean, we have Europe, electric cars and a lot of things, you know, proven technology, but we don't get this stuff on the streets and they, they don't make it down. So we need to connect the dots and bring it down. I'd also say another challenge is the regulatory environment. Um, the Drone Council are doing a, a good job at this. I think us in the private industry and uh, the government as well, everywhere we're trying to get support to get this new up and coming uh, industry in line with, it, with the country. So regulatory challenges, yes, a licensed pilot and ROC, the drone itself needs to have an RLA. The ROC needs to specify the qualifications of that pilot and the nature of the flights and what the drone can or cannot do. Um, it's not yet possible to, to say to people, you know, buy a drone, become an entrepreneur and do your business. We are far from that. A lot of the people in the public still think you can buy a drone and fly it anywhere where you like, <laughs> which is not the case. You know, safety, and uh, again, this ties into awareness. If people know about the rules and the laws, then they will not break them. Um, yeah, that's basically one of the big things. I'd also like to say something regarding the drones capabilities. Um, a lot of drones out there is horses for courses, different things. Um, a lot of the customers that we provide services to sometimes themselves don't understand which kind of drone is, is, is suited for them. So I, th I see we have to look to drones as a tool. And instead of calling ourselves a drone company, we are starting to call ourselves now as a solution company that involves drones in creating our solutions, especially in the security industry. So we are learning, we're growing from strength to strength, but uh, I think awareness is something whereby it should start. And maybe if we can start it out young, we can invest in our future to come. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Gary, just to jump in quickly, because Shaw mentioned, you know, awareness and uptake and, and adoption. Um, do you think that, or what kind of impact will the growing adoption of drone tech have at kind of a regional development and kind of society at large? So, you know, we talk about very specific stuff and specific industries, but taking a more bird's eye view, do you think they have the potential to blow things right, you know, wide open? Are there economic spin-offs from the use job creation? Where do you see that impact kind of lying? I see, you know, personally, I think looking at this from a regional perspective and particularly country, developing countries like South Africa, um, there is major opportunities uh, economically for the economy, things like mid-mile and last mile logistics, especially uh, in the more remote parts of South Africa, like uh, up the West Coast, Northern Cape, and then also the Karoo as well, um, where you have you know, small communities uh, separated by vast distances, um, costs a lot of money to get things in and out there. And this is just the basic stuff. Uh, you know, uh, then you've got, you look at it from more a public perspective. Um, and this is really where I think a, a lot of good is happening from the Western Cape with the EMS services, uh, the South African National Blood Service with Blood Wing, um, you know, the project there to transport blood to remote hospitals. Um, you, you've got Zipline operating in Rwanda and Ghana, transporting uh, samples, but also some, uh, transporting medicines uh, to remote clinics. All of that, 
being done quickly, efficiently, and fast without having to wait weeks for the next run to go out, things like that. So that, that is major opportunities uh, to uplift local communities. But then if you look at, you know, and Charles touched on it, the whole training of people, this is a whole new industry. There's, you know, even though we're talking about multiple people, you know, drones being controlled by one person, um, there's still going to be a requirement for um, drone pilots um, and people to be trained up as that. Uh, you know, we've got a shortage already of, you know, um, of the conventional pilots. Uh, it costs a lot of money. It's, a, you know, all of that. This allows us to train people a lot quicker, a lot faster. Um, although if you look at, you know, some drone pilot programs in the military, for example, um, the US Air Force's drone pilots, uh, minimum requirement, bachelor's degree. Um, they're commissioned as officers. They have to uh, do 40 hours, which is the equivalent of a private pilot's license uh, in a uh, general aviation aircraft before then being trained. And um, because of the nature of the work um, and the training that their dropout rate is basically the same as normal fighter pilots. So it's incredibly high standards that are being set for drone pilots uh, in the military. Um, even in you know the other branches of the service, they you know it's a the US has a funny um, rank called a warrant officer, which is not the same as our sergeant majors in the sort of British and South African army context or military. Um, which and it's very specialized rating. All their helicopter pilots in the US Army are on that rating. So and that they also, you know, a year's training program. That's what's required to become a military drone pilot, which is basically the same as you know most um, pilot training schemes in most militaries for conventional pilots. So it, you know the, the level of skills that will be required, particularly once we start moving away from what they call the SUAS, which is the under 55 pounds or 25 kgs, uh, to these bigger drones that are being developed. Uh, you know, people like Saberwing are developing drones capable of carrying 1.5 tons. Um, and that's a VTOL drone. Uh, there's other initiatives. The Chinese have taken an AN-2 little, it's a biplane, they converted that to a drone. Um, and then there's technologies like X-Wing, uh, Merlin Labs in the United States that are actually taking conventional Cessnas, King Airs and aircraft like that and converting them to fully autonomous drones for cargo transport. And, you know, they still will need to be supervised by uh, highly specialized people sitting in control rooms um, or even in the aircraft initially. Uh, you know, pilots will be flying with them, although they might not touch anything. So, you know, that's what's happening. And you know, the level of skills that we're going to be training up, incredible. I think, I think what's coming through very strongly is, is obviously the knowledge, skills and human capital component. Um, yes. And I'm going to thank you for, for your inputs now. And quickly, bump a question across to Lucicia that ties into to that. So we've got knowledge, skills, human capital development, which is a huge area of investment um, in getting our, our skill sets up in order to dabble in with the 4R tech. Um, we've got the infrastructure side of things, which I think we've got down pat because we've got the technology. It's just about the application. The finances and cost of things can be navigated, um, but the policy environment has come up as, as potentially a challenge. Um, so, Lisicha, I was wondering, you know, for you, what does the future of drone technology look like in South Africa in, in 2030? And moreover, what shifts do you see in kind of the policy or regulatory environment that could facilitate this? In particular, maybe around licensing, the kind of unmanned component and also the safety aspects. Awesome question. Um, next, in, the, in, in 2030, so you're looking at the next nine years, um, technology moves really, really quickly. So um, there's a concept called rate of uh, innovation. And insofar as uh, drones are concerned or the broader concept of, uh, say, urban mobility, it is quite clear that um, every three years, literally the technology seems to amplify significantly more than what the baseline was. Um, so from a regulatory space, I can, I can tell you for a fact that it's, it's a matter of interest. Um, within the 
uh, BRICS Manufacturing Working Group, as well as the Aviation Working Group, um, the discussion around uh, drones as well as um, light aircraft um, that, that could be autonomous as well um, has shot through the roof. It's literally featuring in every second meeting that we have. Um, so it, it is important to ask ourselves the question, how do we create a body of work that not align, that not only aligns on a multilateral level with, with the partners um, that we'll have on a design, manufacturing, operation, as well as uh, standard uh, uh, repairs uh, point of view. But how do we get to a point where um, with, with, within South Africa, the, the, the regulatory space um, is, is not seen as a rigid one size fits all because it really doesn't. Um, so what you'll notice is the likes of uh, the municipalities, uh, the SAPS, are actually also putting in their head to the discussion saying, but hold on, the SACA doesn't control all the areas of concern about these regulations. And then you also have um, citizens as well as private sector that's coming in and say, but we've got models around how we could orchestrate um, an alliance uh, of of, of systems that give us a better result than the current body of work does. So I'll give you a classic example of um, a self-regulatory body, uh, perhaps in the advertising industry, um, the ACA, or in the recycling industry where you have uh, glass recycling. So the, the guys like ADN Bev don't do that on their own and the government doesn't really need to step in that often. So I really think you're going to have this middle ground that then develops, um, that, that can kind of handle the forces from all these different players. And we'll be able to make recommendations around how best we're able to move forward, especially where um, technology starts to uh, better process all the complex decisions that need to be made and is able to give an output more readily. I think the rate of innovation Um, they want to set rules and they want to move on to the next area to set on rules, but no, no quicker do they set up rules and then the technology changes and they realize that the rules are no longer that efficient. Um, so I think the, the, the space is definitely going to uh, change a lot more quickly. Um, there's going to be a, 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 a multi-log type of context that is established rather than having only one entity that, that has the king's share in terms of the decision making. Um, but I think people are also going to become more comfortable as they understand what underpins the technology um, that we'll be using on a day-to-day -day level. And they realize the value that it unlocks across the different aspects of the value chain. Um, those things uh, are what's going to drive the change to making drones uh, a standard. Uh, drones, uh, depending on which size you're talking about. So if, if, if you look at the... Um, the, the recreational type of drones, drones could become as familiar as a cell phone is today. Uh, if you look at the middle mile drone, um, it could become as familiar as um, a one ton bucky. If you look at the, the first mile drone, it could become as familiar um, as a truck. So the, the automotive industry um, the telecommunications industry and the aviation industry in certain instances is actually starting to blend. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what that salad is going to taste like. Super. I love the way you always end off your, your inputs with the, with the nugget. Um, so bearing in mind the various mm -hmm. nuggets that we've actually heard from our speakers, I'm actually going to open up now to the floor and to our participants for questions. Um, I know there are a lot that have been coming through, so I'm going to ask my colleagues if they could, with me not being able to see the chat, if you wouldn't mind just highlighting to me one or two of them that have um, come up. Ah, fantastic. WhatsApp is fantastic. Right. So, questions for Prof. Phillips. Okay, these are very technical questions, but that's great because we've got like the full span of stuff here. What composites are being used for the frameworks in the drones that are being development, de developed? And then back to that payload question, what is the payload of the drones being developed at Nelson Mandela University? That one's for Prof. Phillips. 
Thanks for the question. And we, we use a mixture of composites between normal e-glass and carbon fiber, depending on the application. That VTOL machine that you see there has a mix. The fuselage, for example, is e-glass. And the booms, which are obviously very important, are built of carbon fiber. And then in terms of payload, they vary that big multi-rotor that you saw we could lift about 40 kilograms of payload easily, maybe even up to 60. And then the big VTOL is aimed at an 80 kilogram payload. So almost to the point where it's the mass of a person, if he was brave enough, of course. But yes, hopefully that answers the questions. It reminds me of that uh, movie of the guy with the deck chair and the balloons, you know, very brave. Very brave. Very brave indeed. <laughs> Thanks, Prof. Um, we've got a quick question here for Gary. Again, a very like technical question, a very high grade question. I, I'm not sure who it was from, but um, right. Will it be possible to carry a DFT instrument to take readings of coating thickness? It is required to place the sensor perpendicularly onto the surface for at least 0.1 seconds. Gary, do you know what this man is talking about? I'm not sure what the what sensor that would be, uh, sort of start, uh, beyond my paycheck, but uh, I do believe with a lot of, and what I've seen with some of the drones is incredibly precise controls. Um, so I think it is possible. Uh, it depends on the drone. Uh, it would have to be a high quality drone um, and possible and would have to be autonomous. Um, I don't think that uh, you know the average remote pilot would be able to, you know, have that level of control to actually be able to touch something for a split second. But I do believe with autonomous and from the technologies I've seen, um, that is very possible. Uh, you know, in reasonable conditions. I think you know you also have to have. Uh, no gusting winds or anything else like that. But I do believe that would be possible with the technology that's available today. Super. Um, I actually see that question came from Ian. And DFT is dry film thickness. So I've learned something today. And it's Me about too. application of paint on steelwork. And I suppose that's really relative, relevant in the Soldana context, um, you know, being one of the primary kind of manufacturing components they are hosted in the zone there. Um, cool. So I've learned something now as well. Thanks so much, Gary, for, for outlining that. Um, all right. Also, another higher grade question for the panel. So panelists, first to pop up their hand and switch on your camera, you can respond to this one. What about drones regarding Marpol, Solas, and ISPs? as well as the Abidjan MOU and the Doha Agreement. I'm not sure what any of those say, so I'll be learning a bit now. Um, also, the deployment of drones by landlocked countries as safe navigation and passage is granted by UN CLOS. And the floor is open. Go! Maybe it's Gary. Let's take please. a stab at it. I think that refers to these agreements around uh, air traffic and uh, specifically passenger, air you know, aircraft movements. Um, personally, you know, I don't think there is much of a distinction between a man existing manned aircraft and drones, particularly as those lines are being blurred. If you think about it, uh, Airbus recently flew gate to gate an Airbus A350 completely autonomously. So it taxied, it took off, it flew, it landed, and it went back to the gate uh, with the two pilots basically sitting there drinking their tea during the flight. So I think, you know, existing regulations should cover, uh, you know, the larger drones. And I think that's really what people are looking at in terms of being able to transfer cargo. Um, you know, it, it's really about the regulators approving the use of unmanned aerial vehicles, autonomous aerial vehicles flying in, you know, traditional flight lanes. Cool. Um, thanks, Gary. And that raises the question in my mind as well, and maybe Lasitia can help with this one. Um, are you aware of any systems being developed that can actually identify or detect drones that are not supposed to be there? 
in particular a space or water um, bodies or wherever yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely so um the interesting about air, the interesting thing about aerospace is we've had a lot of um, sensory technology development for the longest time. I mean, if you look at what the guys at uh, Air Traffic Navigation Service are doing, that's in essence the type of effect you'd require over there. So, um, if ever you've watched um, a horror movie that has something go wrong with an airplane, you'd hear something about a black box. So that black box is what usually takes all of this aeronautical data and, 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 and stores it uh, within, within the aircraft. So uh, using very similar technology, uh, maybe adding a couple of lines um, of, of coding, you, you should be able to detect which aircraft um, uh, belongs in a particular area. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, on, on any aircraft, you'll have a tail number. And that, that tail number is not the only way to be able to identify the aircraft. So there's the radio signals and so on that it also sends. So something very similar could be done with drones. But in order for that to be effective, you, you need to have a system where um, you can adequately register every single drone system. Take, for example, what happens with uh, a mobile phone um, through Rika, or before you can open a bank account, you need to FICA it. So that there is absolute traceability about the, the, the point of entrance, who the current owner is, um, what are they permitted to be able to do um, based on their qualifications or expertise, uh, and at what particular times. Now, the problem currently in South Africa is that, believe it or not, there are 200 to 300 unregistered, uh, thousand regis unregistered drones. So 200,000 to 300,000 unregistered drones, mainly in the recreational uh, space. So th the question is, um, for all of these aircraft, it's, it's not a really difficult exercise. You can also do it post-purchase, but you, you need the regulatory environment to understand that um, a technology such as this is not a fad. Um, it's going to stay around because of the legitimate value that it provides. And also because um, it's, 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 it's a critical component to the excitement of STEM. So any child that might tell you they love the arts or they love um, the sciences uh, have a fanatical ability to continue doing it because um, it, it has that emotional cue. Now, it's the same thing with drones. Um, if, if, if you find a pilot and you ask them if they would do anything else other than flying, the likely answer they're going to give you is no, because that's really how much they love it. Um, and I believe it's, it's exactly the same type of sentiment that is developing um, within, within the drone space. Um, so, you know, it's interesting times that lie ahead. So buckle in. Um, and if people think drones are um, the, the most challenging thing that's going to come out of the regulatory market, I beg to differ. Um, there are a couple of companies now that have been looking at um, jetpacks. So you can have an individual literally fly uh, in, in mid space. So how, how, how the regulatory environment is going to handle that, I'm not quite sure. But yet again, let's all get on the jumping castle and have some fun. Speaking of getting on the jumping castle, Zane, I wonder if you want to jump in here because I know you've got experience in developing uh, anti-drone tech or detection tech. Thanks, Lisa. The Lasici is quite spot on. I mean, uh, but the anti-drone environment, uh, I posted our website, I said earlier on, that's been a space that we've been playing in for quite a while. Uh, you know, development started, again, like Gary said earlier on, a lot of things happened in the US and so on. But I think it became more real a few years back when there was an attempt on, on a head of state's life while he was in a podium with armed with uh, UAVs as being armed and all this kind of stuff, which was small UAVs and so on. So it, it got us thinking about five or so years back. We've successfully implemented anti-drone uh, devices in, in three different countries already. So that is not pie in the sky stuff, it's happening. Yes, there is the difficult part of registration of, of the drones, is, I mean, in the South African context. Um, but, you know, you're one of your biggest, um, I think, commercial drone um, manufacturer in the world is DJI, which, mo DJI, which most people know of, from kids uh, right through to professionals are flying it. And there's actually a database that is, that is run 
by the, both the updates of, of radio frequencies, the type of drones, um, you name it. That's everything is on there. You know, where was it purchased? Where was it manufactured? So these things exist. Our problem is, like Lasitza said as well, you, the tech evolves so quickly that if you try and over-regulate this thing, you're never going to get a regulation. That's the one thing. So you're always going to have the fear of this unknown. Um, uh, we've successfully implemented it purely because our neighbors are a lot more forward thinking and you don't try and over-regulate this. Uh, because drones, as much as there is a heck of a lot of good in it, it also comes with extremely bad elements to it. I'm sure with the time on hands, a lot of people has watched Netflix, as I said earlier on, uh, look how the guys smuggle drugs nowadays by, <laughs> by submarine. You know, so it doesn't have to be surface vehicles anymore. It's a subsurface vehicle. And with the drones expansion and range of endurance uh, getting so much better, these things are no longer pie in the sky. We've seen it. Uh, it it's been happening. I mean, uh, look at the, the hundreds of millions that was lost in an airport purely because a drone was found to fly in an unregulated airspace. Um, and so the list goes on. So anti-drone devices, people are not a pie in the sky. It exists. We've been in the market, we've done it for the last five years, implemented abroad already. Um, and I'm telling you, it's, it, it's it, uh, you know, the technologies into that, as I said, and as the teacher said as well, because you have the ability to have navigated uh, air traffic control for so long, drones is nothing but another vehicle, either in the air or the land or a subsurface. Thanks so much. Sure, I see you've got your hand up. And before you speak, I'm actually going to ask if, you know, you want to weigh in on, on this aspect, but then also move across to a question for you around, is this the kind of stuff that can be taught at a TV college? Um, and then adding my own little bit on that, everybody mentioned STEM when in fact it's STEAM. So how do we inject the kind of power of imagination into the way we are growing our pipeline of young people to move into this industry. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, Charles, if you could chat to that. And then after that, I'll do a quick wrap up because we do have a, a bit of a Mentimeter action we would like for our participants to, to play with. And then I will be handing over to Kashif after that. So Charles. Uh, uh, thank you, Lisa. Just to weigh in on the, the anti-drone technology. So, uh, you know, from my army background, there was once a general that, that was famous for saying a, a good plan today is better than the perfect plan tomorrow. Um, Over-regulating, there's a lot of heavy stuff in this industry. Um, yes, as mentioned by Zain, there is a lot of um, heavy anti-drone equipment available, military-grade things that can disrupt the signal to a drone and cause it to fall out of the sky. However, in a developing and emerging industry like we have here, and with a lot of the development that's going to center around the urban environment, bringing drones in closer to where people are to inspect infrastructure, to do that kind of a job, you know, to, to take an overly aggressive stance and cause drones to fall out of the sky because uh, one of the children flew his Phantom 3 in a, at the doggy park, you are going to cause so much more harm by disrupting controlled flight into uncontrolled flight and maybe that drone falls on somebody's head. Um, from our industry, what we have done is uh, in the commercial drone side, we do a proper fleet management. These are things that are stipulated by ROCs. There's a software available called Flight Up and things that you connect all your fleet drones to. You can see in real time where they are and it's like a basically a, a, a app for um, air traffic control. Um, filling in flight plans, booking airspace with a civil aviation um, through flexible use of airspace. All these things must be done on the commercial side. As long as the commercial operators, the IBI, and, and we set the standard in a way we, we uh, is all, all of us are pioneers in some stage, the civil aviation can in a few years demand that all commercial drones carry mode C transponders, the same as aircraft. Already the drones have got Zulu Tango registrations, RLA, all those things. So there's a way that those things will become or will settle down to the hobbyists, you know, awareness. I come back to that. We are, you know, there's uh, small drone courses that are being developed, you know, uh, much cheaper courses to help keep the hobbyists away from the, you know, bad rules <laughs> that if they break them, it's going to get them into trouble. But again, awareness, these things can be started at school as well. 
um, the, the basic subject of geography. We learn about our, our cities, we learn about our ports and geography. Why can't our kids learn about airspaces and how are they managed? Why don't we slot in aviation to lower level education? So we grow people. You know, the airspace is another dynamic. It's a level of where commerce is going to be. We are using it. We have got no excuse not to teach our people about this. So, yes. Um, uh, so a good plan today is self-regulation is a good thing, good cooperation with civil aviation, municipal laws, the SAPS, you know, um, and should the need arise for people misusing drones, because that is also happening, um, we should have them the means to at least identify where's the controller and confront the person and, you know, take it from there. But to just start shooting at drones from the sky, you know, that is happening in our company. We've had drones coming back from legal operations with uh, interesting damage to them. So, you know, <laughs> seeing a drone in the sky and taking aggressive action, you don't know what's the purpose of that drone. And even if it is on a legal flight or not, the average Joe on the street might not know. So we do not want the public to, to get a negative connotation to drone. And it brings us back to the awareness. Um, to answer your other question, uh, just to, to check, uh, you asked about the TVET colleges um, regarding drone training there. I think uh, a program such as we are doing here at the Genesis Hub, I think this program may be, be able to slot into the TVET college. However, I just want to mention that the drone is a tool. There is still a lot of qualified RPL drone pilots in our country that do not have work. The, the, the cost of the ROC, the cost to put together the whole system to be able to, to call it a drone business legally and to fly these things for commercial or corporate gain, that is a route to travel. And at this stage, it's not uh, going to be able for one person to do this. Um, however, we can migrate to this and, and instead maybe teach people to slot somewhere into the industry, maybe as drone pilots into existing businesses we should focus to create a drone infrastructure and grow the, 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 the people that will operate these drones together with the people that will manage these drones, the people that's going to build them. It's a whole ecosystem that we need to build with everyone that plays their part. Um, the TVET college thing, you know, especially with technical training, I think for infrastructure, if you have somebody that's studying metallurgy or um, bridge design, something like that, to, to take such a person, train him as a drone pilot, as an additional skill, making use of, of what he's mainly taught to do. To fly a drone, is it, it's not such a difficult thing to do, but to fly a drone needs to be coupled to what is your output? What are you using the drone to do? And the TVET College maybe can link up on, on that technical aspect of it. So yeah, I would say it's a very interesting thing to uh, investigate and maybe people should talk about this in future. Thank you. Thanks, Charles. Um, so, unfortunately, um, Prof. Russell, I do see your hand up, um, but in the interest of time, we are actually two minutes over time and we want to kind of wrap up things. Um, if you wouldn't mind, Prof, to maybe just pop your input into the um, chat section and we can include that in our feedback loop. But, um, you know, from today's session, we really see that drone technology has huge potential. We've listed a number of benefits from cost savings right through to reduced safety risks, ability to, you know, apply this tech in many sectors, um, ranging from service delivery right through to logistics. Um, one of the thoughts that comes up for me is even in dropping vaccinations, um, you know, vaccines during the pandemic. Um, there are a couple of challenges. I think the IP environment and the regulatory en environment, perhaps looking at how we can enable um, you know, kind of reform in that regard. And then also looking at privacy laws, the unmanned component, um, but with all things, it swings and roundabouts. So we really need to look at ways to take the challenges and turn them into opportunities. Um, I think for me, what I want to wrap up with is really a, a sort of call to action or a question to those participating and those in the ecosystem, really saying how might we collaborate as academia, private sector, and the policy makers to create a body of expertise and work that can increase our innovation outputs, can increase the application of those outputs, as well as the uptake of those outputs. A second how might we is also how might we prime our youth to have an interest in moving into this, section, uh, this sector. So for the audience, um, we do have a follow-up poll 
it sort of run through Mentimeters. So I'm just going to ask that you guys actually use your phone, hover it over the uh, QR code, and that will then bring up a couple of questions for you to answer. Um, really like to thank today's speakers for sharing their knowledge with us as well as the audience for joining in today as they've really actively participated, even though we haven't managed to get to all the questions. This particular webinar series is part of the unofficial launch of the Innovation Campus Drone Technology Innovation Showcase at Challenge. So I'm sure you're gonna receive more information about that. I'd like to hand over to Kashifa now just to, to say cheers and uh, give us her final five cents. It's maybe two cents because of time and wish you a really fantastic day further. Um, and as somebody said, it's not STEM, it's not STEAM, it's STEAMY. So I uh, hope you've got a STEAMY cup of coffee waiting for you on the other side. Kashifa, over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Um, can, uh, I, I know the, the, the board is up, but I, I wouldn't be uh, fulfilling my job, doing my job if I didn't make a punt for a call to action. Um, and I'd just like to share my screen quickly, please. Great, great, thank you. Um, so uh, I, we've, we've, we've announced it on um, LinkedIn and on various platforms and today was really the kickoff of this innovation showcase. This process, um, these series of events that we want to launch, uh, uh, run focused on drone technologies. And um, so, uh, today was the webinar that kicked it off, but there's a whole host of other things that we want to do. Um, and one of them is the Innovation Showcase itself, uh, an, an entrepreneur pitching event and support, and then Build Code Fly in the schools that we're working with through the IDZ Schools Program, which is being run with the Link Center and uh, um, at Wits University and Stellenbosch. So um, I'm going to get right to the meat and potatoes. Um, the timeline for the rest of the year is as follows. Um, today we had the webinar announcing and launching this off. Uh, we're looking for partners on this journey, on, on, on the showcase, on the Build Code Fly events, and the uh, pitch, the entrepreneur pitching den. And prizes to give to the entrepreneurs um, and support them with entrepreneurship, uh, uh, business development support um, once they win. Um, so it's, we intend to run it for the rest of the year and we really need your help. Um, you know, uh, how, and how you can get involved, if there's a value for you in uh, advertising uh, your opportunity, your brand and associating your brand with the IDZ and Innovation Campus and Drone Technology, please contact us. We're looking for judges on the different rounds of the showcase and the pitching event. And also then in the drone showcase itself, demonstrators of drone technologies, uh, keynote speakers and facilitators, uh, streaming platforms to reach a bigger audience um, and, and, and uh, the bold code fly event. So what we want to do is take the cohort of learners and teachers that, and, that we have been um, partnering with on our mathematics uh, uh, development um, um, program and take them through a course on just experimenting with drone coding, assembly and piloting and have a fly challenge, you know, a one day fly challenge. And uh, we're also looking for drone donations, you know, so we really want this to be embedded in the schools um, and obviously certainly partnering with the YES program to just build it out further. And then prizes, so cash prizes for podium winners on entrepreneurs who win at the pitching event, um, companies to come on board as partners um, to, to those you know, um, entrepreneurs. Because at the end of the day, and I think we did raise it, that is the commercialization of these technologies and of this momentum that will sustain um, and, and just uh, you know, reap the, 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 the potential that the drone technology has for Africa. Mentorship and coaching. So if you have a program in place and it faces and, and can align with us, then please contact us. Um, yeah, so uh, that's, that's, that's my pitch. Um, and 
I just want to thank everybody for for um, for attending. And I think this has been a bumper audience, and I love the dialogue. And yeah, I've I've made notes um, that we will certainly take forward um, um, for the rest of the year. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa.